Hello, and thank you for coming back for part three. So now we're going to talk about the gram-positive spore-forming rods. And another name for a rod shape is bacillus, so the genre of bacillus. There are two disease-causing agents, bacillus anthracis and bacillus cereus. The other genre we're going to discuss is clostridium. So clostridium botulinum, clostridium perfringens, clostridium tetany, clostridium difficile. So some of these you've heard before. So let's do it. So the two bacillus, bacillus cereus and bacillus anthracis. So bacillus cereus, I didn't make another slide for it because it's not all that complicated. But guess what it causes? Yes, it causes food poisoning. And once again, this is going to be a quick onset, so from eating food containing bacteria that have produced a toxin. So how this usually works is these are spore formers, and spores are pretty much everywhere in the environment. The spores land on food, then they germinate, and then they produce a toxin. So fun thing about Bacillus cereus is, depending upon the strain, you can have the emetic toxin, which is going to act very, very quickly. It is also heat stable, so when a person ingests, it's called the reheated rice syndrome. So foods, they've been cooked, the spores can make it through the boiling process, then they germinate and food is kept warm, and then it makes its toxin. And then even after you reheat that food, the toxin is heat stable, and so that causes vomiting, so within one to five hours. Also, there's another type of enterotoxin made by Bacillus cereus, and this is going to cause watery diarrhea. This one is not heat stable. Usually the diarrhea is going to come on about 10 hours or so after you've ingested the toxin. And so it's usually going to be on cool foods or prepared foods. So you can get just nausea and vomiting, followed by watery diarrhea or you could just get the watery diarrhea. So just, yeah, if you've ever had one of those instances where you think you're done and then you're not. So bacillus cereus. And so emetic, remember that's for uh, vomiting, a particular type of enterotoxin. Entero always means intestine. And usually this is going to be self-limiting, so you just give them supportive therapy. And then to prevent by refrigerating foods after cooking to stop them from sporulating and making that toxin. So that would be for that heat uh, sensitive toxin. So our other one is Bacillus anthracis. So this is a old disease and the name anthracis comes from the cutaneous wound. So this is Spores from the environment would enter through a wound and you get cutaneous anthrax. Cutaneous means skin. And you get these black types of lesions. And so anthracis, that last part of the word, means black like coal. So it starts off anything from just a tiny little itch. You go all the way to an ulcer. These have a unique capsule that allows them to evade the immune system. And then they have these two, two very deadly toxins. One is called edema factor, so you get swelling, and the other one is called the lethal factor. Remember, these are cytotoxins, so they are going to damage cells. They are also coded for on a plasmid, so part of that mobile gene pool. They can go into the bloodstream, so you get septicemia, and cutaneous anthrax is the more common version of anthrax. It is also less virulent. It is fatal in about 20% of the cases. And you can also, uh, this is common in heroin users. So uh, just through that break in the skin. The less common but way more virulent is inhalation anthrax. And so that is when the spores enter the lungs, they germinate, and this is high, high mortality. So we're going to watch a YouTube. The possibility of a terrorist attack is a scary thought and a very real danger. Terrorists could attack the American public in many different ways, including a bomb or by releasing a chemical, radiologic, or biologic agent. A biologic attack, or bioterrorism, is the intentional release of viruses, bacteria, or other germs 
to cause illness or death in people, animals, or plants. Anthrax is the most likely agent to be used in a biologic attack. It only takes a small amount to infect a large number of people. It's inexpensively grown from just a few spores and can be easily engineered to be drug resistant, which means it's more difficult to treat with antibiotics. So what exactly is anthrax? It's a naturally occurring bacteria in soil that can be transferred from infected animals to humans, usually by handling animal products like hides or eating undercooked meat. Now anthrax can also infect humans by breathing in spores that have been engineered as a weapon. In 2001, anthrax spores were mailed to news reporters and U.S. senators. These attacks involved letters which held only one gram of powdered spores, about the amount in a sugar packet, and still 22 people were infected and five people died. In comparison, an attack that used two kilograms of anthrax, about the size of a five-pound bag of sugar, could infect 100,000 people or more. Scientists have developed models of what an anthrax attack might look like. Anthrax sprayed from a plane or truck onto a city is a likely scenario. People may not see, smell, or even hear the anthrax being released. This type of attack would lead to inhalation anthrax, the most severe form of the disease, which starts with fever and other flu-like symptoms. Symptoms usually appear about 1 to 42 days after inhaling these spores. Now, unfortunately, once there are symptoms, it may be too late to treat with antibiotics. All of this sounds frightening, and it is. But CDC and other federal agencies are working with your state and local health departments, and they're taking steps to prepare the nation for a potential attack. CDC helps manage a program called Biosense, and this program detects potential bioterrorism releases, including anthrax in communities. Biosense and other local systems help ensure that authorities are aware of an attack and can get medicines to those exposed as soon as the agent has been identified. Medicine for a bioterrorism response is stored in the Strategic National Stockpile, or the SNS. If a terrorist attack occurred, CDC would distribute antibiotics from the stockpile to your state and local health departments who would dispense it to affected communities. Now here at CDC, we conduct emergency preparedness exercises to help us plan, prepare, and practice what to do in the event of an attack. Exercises may include distributing medical supplies or evaluating a laboratory's ability to collect and test samples. Other exercises involve subject matter experts who work through an emergency scenario from start to finish, determining all the steps various agencies need to take. We also learn from real events in our communities, such as the 2009 H1N1 pandemic. While the threat of a terrorist attack is frightening, it's important to remember that CDC and other agencies are taking steps to protect our communities. We have medicine and trained staff ready to act. You can learn more about anthrax at www.emergency.cdc.gov. So these spores are naturally occurring. They are usually associated with animal and animal-like products. Another case of inhalation anthrax that just occurred naturally uh, happened in New York, I believe. A person had purchased old drums from Africa and then played the drums and there were spores because it was animal hide spread across the drum. And so inhalation anth anthrax, way less common, but high mortality rate. People that work with animal hides and animals, there is also a, a vaccine that can be given to give immunity to that. So cutaneous anthrax, more common, enters through a wound, not as fatal as inhalation anthrax. So bacillus anthracis. So our next genre is Clostridium. And so we're gonna look at these four. So Clostridium perfringens, Clostridium difficile, Clostridium tetani, and Clostridium botulinum. And so once again, these are spore formers. 
So these are going to be naturally occurring in the environment. They form that spore, which is very resistant to desiccation and harsh conditions, so drying out, heat, cold, the survival structure. The genre, they are grandfather rods. They are obligate anaerobes, so they are obliged. They must, they cannot grow in the presence of oxygen. They also have a particular needle shape, endospores, and like I said, they're found in soil. Just to kind of remind you, because it's, it's been a while. So if there's harsh conditions, a cell goes through sporulation, and then the endospore is dormant, and then when the conditions become favorable again, then they germinate. So Clostridium difficile and Clostridium botulinum are the first two, that's for you. All right, we've talked about Clostridium difficile, and so usually when someone's on broad spectrum antibiotics, that allows this bacterium to overgrow. They are naturally occurring in the body, but normally they're kept in check by the other microflora. It is the number one cause of hospital-associated diarrhea, and once again, depending upon the strain and the virulence and the extent of the infection, a uh, profuse, foul smelling, a very distinctive smell, watery, or it can go to bloody diarrhea, so dysentery. Uh, once again, since we're affecting the intestines, this is an entrotoxin, that's how you get the watery diarrhea. If that bacterium has a cytotoxin, then it can be invasive, invasive and get bloody diarrhea, so that is that dysentery. And then they looked at this and they thought it was like a membrane, so it's called pseudomembranous colitis when it gets invasive like that. And it is on the rise in frequency, virulence, and also, guess what? Antibiotic resistance because the people that this thrives in were on broad spectrum antibiotics. So it's opportunistic, like I said, it's part of the normal intestinal flora. And so sometimes if it's antibiotic resistant, it's at the person does not respond to uh, the therapy. And so treatment is going to be a fecal transplant. Yes, that is exactly what it sounds like. So you take feces from a healthy donor, which is populated with the good bacteria, processing, which I'll be honest, I don't know exactly what that entails, but they can encapsulate into pills or they make a liquid and then they deliver it either through the nose or it's swallowed in the capsule through the mouth. And the idea is that you would be reseeding the colon with good bacteria so that clostridium could not overgrow. Competition. Uh, I think we covered everything. That's for you. You need the story. So the next two, so clostridium botulinum and clostridium tetany, they both make a neurotoxin. They are both, once again, these are gonna be in the environment and the soil, they both make endospores. So Clostridium botulinum, so this causes a food poisoning, only this type of neurotoxin is going to cause flaccid paralysis. So I'm going to call this floppy baby, and I'm not making fun of the babies. We'll talk about why, particularly babies, in just a minute. But how this neurotoxin acts is that it uh, blocks the release of acetylcholine. So remember, those motor neurons are talking to skeletal muscles and... The neurotransmitter acetylcholine is the ferryman that takes that nerve stimulus to the muscle. And so if it's not released, you get a type of paralysis where the muscles are relaxed. In the case of Clostridium tetany, they got its name from uh, tetany, which is that maximum sustained contraction. And so what it does, you get what's called spastic paralysis. Normally, you've got muscles on one side of a limb that are contracting, and then you have the inhibitor muscles are relaxing. And so you've got excitatory stimulus, and then you have inhibitory stimulus. And so in this case, that inhibitor is blocked, and so you just get muscle contraction. And so that's called spastic paralysis. And so often you're seeing this in infants, so floppy baby syndrome is clostridium botulinum, and then when you see tetanus, rigid baby, then it's clostridium tetani. And they're, they're both neurotoxins. One just causes muscles to not contract. The other one causes muscles to have that sustained muscle contraction. Actual cases of clostridium botulinum, they're rare in the United States. It is, like I said, that powerful neurotoxin. 
and it's what's used uh, cosmetically injected into, uh, it's diluted out and then injected into uh, facial muscles to stop wrinkles or to reduce the sign of wrinkles. Where you get the floppy baby syndrome, you can see that this is looking at what's called infant botulism. Yeah. I don't know if you've heard of that, that children under the age of one should not consume raw, unfiltered honey. And then there was, of course, a push for all natural products, and a lot of our foods have high fructose corn syrup. And so mothers, in uh, wanting to do the right thing by their babies, would get them honey instead of using sugar. And then, of course, you know, being more organic and saying raw and unfiltered. So honey contains those spores from Clostridium botulinum. If you're an adult and you ingest that honey, your immune system takes care of those spores. If you are an infant or a baby, however, your immune system, once again, not being developed, those spores germinate, they make the toxin, and then you get floppy baby syndrome. Uh, what happens though, is just, it's gonna be gradual, the baby's just gonna stop moving, and you don't want it to go to the diaphragm, so the respiratory muscle is also skeletal muscle, and so you have to do respiratory care, treatment with an antitoxin, and just sort of wait it out until it is cleared by the body. So sloppy baby. Clostridium tetany, so its toxin is called titanospasm, so we get spastic paralysis. And like I said, normally you have flexion, then you have extension in uh, tetanus, also called locked jaw because it would start in the skeletal muscles of the jaw first. Both the flexors and extensors are tense at the same time, so that's called spastic paralysis. It too can lead to respiratory failure because the diaphragm is skeletal muscle. So these neurotoxins affect the skeletal muscles and then also what a person would die from if they did not receive treatment would be respiratory failure. There you go, that's for you. So our, I think it's our last one, Clostridium perfringens. And so I'm gonna do it with pictures, but there's that information for you. So what it causes, it causes two things, food poisoning, but we'll talk about the wound infection first. So gas gangrene, or it's called clostridial myonecrosis. So myo means muscle, and we talked about necrosis already, so death. So in order for this to occur, remember these are going to be naturally occurring uh, spores. They have to get into a wound, and it can be a minor wound, but there has to be poor circulation. So uh, poor circulation is gonna lead to those anaerobic conditions which will cause that germination and then you get the production of toxins. And so it's a very strong toxin, A. it's called alpha toxin, it is a cytotoxin. So it's gonna destroy tissue, it basically cuts the phospholipid heads off of cell membranes. And usually what you're gonna see this in, this is what a lot of soldiers would die from, so wounds, particularly when shrapnel or things get into a wound and soldiers, they're out in the environment and so spores get in there and then it's a nice anaerobic condition. You can also see this too in diabetics because they have very poor circulation, typically in their extremities, you can also see it. Anyone that has poor circulation enters through a wound, you get dead tissue and anaerobic conditions that can flourish. So interesting thing, like I said, this is if you've ever watched old movies, uh, when they talk about amputation, it got gas gangrene. And so there uh, are stories that they talked they called it angel's glow. And so if a soldier had a wound and he was in the field and it was nighttime and their wound glowed, they had a higher chance of living. The reason they were glowing was because of a bioluminescent bacteria that was a symbiote of a nematode, a naturally occurring roundworm. And so what was happening is these worms were basically eating their flesh, so debriding the wound, and then the bacteria were secreting antibiotics. And so I'll just let you the article, but they just called it angel's glow. And so if a soldier was in the field with a wound and it was glowing because of the nematodes and the bacteria inside the nematodes, they had a higher chance of living. So clostridial myonecrosis, gas gang green. And so uh, they produce gas as inside as they are fermenting, um, going through fermentation. And so that sort of aids 
total gas bubbles aid the spread of infection. They also cause food poisoning. So in this case, the spores are going to germinate once again. They're going to make a toxin just like Staphylococcus aureus and Bacillus cereus. And this is going to be an enterotoxin. You get acute abdominal pain and diarrhea. And so it actually causes a lot of cases of food poisoning. So yeah, that's a big number. So 966,000 cases per year in the United States. So Clostridium perfringens, Staphylococcus aureus, and Bacillus cereus all make a enterotoxin and secrete that into food. And so these are going to be quick onset with symptoms, so acute. All right, I'm going to stop here, come back for the non-spore formers.